Welcome to a very normal therapeutics training video. Today I'm going to continue on the topic of non-parametric statistics. We're going to look at the non-parametric analog to the two-sample t-test and learn how to decide when a non-parametric or parametric test is appropriate for your problem. Remember that you are a fictional new employee in my fictional pharma company, and I'm in charge of making sure you know your stuff when it comes to statistics. But if you're totally new to the channel, my name's Christian and this is Very Normal, a channel for making you better at statistics. Let's get started. In the first part, we learned about what non-parametric statistics are, and I also taught you about Wilcoxon's sign rank test. Non-parametric statistics can be thought of as the set of statistical models that try to minimize the number or strength of the assumptions you need to make. As statisticians, we're in the business of dealing with data and unpredictable randomness that's inherent in this data, and we deal with it through mathematical models. These models often have various assumptions we need to make. For example, the t-tests require us to assume that the data is either normally distributed or that we have enough data to use the central limit theorem as an approximation. The results of these models are only accurate and trustworthy if the assumptions are reasonable. If they're not, then it's harder to trust the results. Therefore, if we're dealing with a data situation that can violate these assumptions, then non-parametric methods can help give us reliable results in light of these violations. As with most things in statistics, there are trade-offs. Non-parametric statistics let us relax assumptions, but they can come at the expense of being more complicated or harder to explain to collaborators. Later on in the video, we'll see more of these trade-offs in action. In part one, I was monitoring how much time my fictional employees spend on non-work sites. But the data that came out of this had a lot of outliers. A consequence of these characteristics is that the typical assumption of the t-test may not be reasonable. Since the last video, I'm happy to tell you that I've installed some new software in my employees' computers to help try to cut down on non-productivity. To check if this new software works, I installed it on a random group of computers. It's really hard to install this software secretly, so in the end I have data for a total of 20 employees. 10 people don't have the software in the computers, and 10 do. The question I want to answer is whether or not my little intervention has an effect on reducing this time. This is a classic two-sample problem. I'm going to use a non-parametric analog called the mann whitney wilcoxon test. For short, I'll call it the MW2 test. This test gets its name from the fact that it was independently developed by two groups of people. Henry Mann and Donald Whitney published this test in this paper, but Frank Wilcoxon proposed a similar test in this paper. For the super nerdy out there, Wilcoxon also proposed the sign rank test in this paper as well. We're dealing with the hypothesis test, so I'm going to treat it the same way we've covered in past employee training videos. First, we're going to go through the assumptions of the test, understand the parameter of interest, the null hypothesis, the test statistic, and the null distribution. The test assumes that we're collecting data from two independent populations. The samples themselves are also assumed to be independent and identically distributed. I'll assume the data to be continuous, and that the data from these populations each have their own distribution, which I'll denote as big F and big G. I'm using capital letters because I'm specifically referring to the cumulative distribution function, or CDF in this case. These CDFs can be general and don't need to come from a parametric family, but we do need to impose one slight restriction on one of the CDFs. We need to assume that the distributions are the same, but just that one of them is shifted by some value theta. As you might expect, the parameter I'm interested in learning more about is this location shift theta. In our example, this would be the change in time spent on non-work websites. If the parameter of interest for the MW2 test is this location shift, you might be tempted to think that the null hypothesis for the test is based on theta, but that's actually wrong. The null hypothesis states that the CDFs for the two groups are equal to each other for all values of t. If the CDFs are equal to each other, then by extension, their probability density functions are also the same. Therefore, the data from both groups come from the same law. You can think of this null hypothesis based on the CDF as a more general case of this null hypothesis from the t-test. The alternative hypothesis is that one of the distributions is what we call stochastically larger than the other. For simplicity, we'll say that y is larger than x. To denote this, we write that the CDF of y is less than or equal to the CDF of x. This may seem weird, but let's visualize it. From the perspective of the PDF, the distribution of y is greater than x, so it's shifted to the right. But if we take these two PDFs and convert them to their CDFs, we'll see that in fact the CDF for Y is lower than that of X. What this captures is that percentiles in Y are generally greater than the corresponding percentiles in X. We have to distinguish between the data from X and Y and the CDF of X and Y. 
Now that we know the null hypothesis, let's move on to the test statistic. Or statistics, actually. Remember that Mann, Whitney, and Wilcoxon proposed this test on two separate occasions. Even though we grouped them together in the same test today, they actually proposed different statistics. Wilcoxon used the sum of ranks for one of the groups in his version, whereas Mann and Whitney use a sum of pairwise comparisons. Even though the two statistics are different, you can derive the value of one statistic directly from the other. This means that they'll give the same conclusions for rejecting the null hypothesis. In part 1, we saw that the signed rank statistic was non-parametric because it's distribution-free. That is, its null distribution doesn't depend on the original distribution of the data. It's the same for both Wilcoxon and Mann-Whitney statistics. Both of them are based on transformations of the original data, which helps remove any dependence on the population distribution. In code, R conducts the test based on Mann and Whitney statistic, so we'll look at it a bit more. This is a double sum, and it iterates over all the indices in both samples. What's happening here is that each observation in X is being compared to each observation in Y. If it's greater, then this indicator value is 1, and thus increments the value of the statistic. In essence, we're counting the number of times that a value of x is greater than a value from y. Under the null hypothesis, the two groups come from the same distribution. So, there's no reason for an observation from x to tend to be bigger or smaller than those in y. This means that x will be the larger value 50% of the time. The total number of comparisons that are made in this double sum are n sub x times n sub y. The sample size of x times the sample size of y. Under the null hypothesis, you would expect the statistic to be half this total. Under the alternative hypothesis, the observations in Y will tend to be bigger than those in X. Thus, more of the comparisons in the statistic will favor Y. If the location shift is big enough, then it's possible to see a test statistic close to zero. If we flip the labels, then the statistic will be close to the total number of comparisons. Therefore, the Mann-Whitney statistic will tend to be extreme, depending on which group is bigger. Once the test statistic is calculated, we have to be able to compare it to a null distribution to calculate a p-value. It's possible to visualize a rough approximation of the null distribution thanks to what the null hypothesis is. Under the null hypothesis, the two groups have the same distribution. What that implies is that the specific group that an observation is assigned to doesn't really matter. If we switch the label of the first observation of each group, it would be difficult to tell from the data itself that we made the switch. In fact, we could scramble all of the group labels and still not be able to easily tell. To construct the null distribution, we can repeat the following process. Scramble the group assignments across all of the observations, calculate the test statistic, and repeat this for all the possible permutations. You can see that, unsurprisingly, the null distribution has somewhat of a bell shape. This bell shape is centered on 50, which happens to be half the number of comparisons we need to make for two samples with 10 observations each. Depending on how much data we have, R will either calculate the exact permutation distribution or use a normal approximation. The function that implements the MW2 test is the Wilcox.test function. To do this, we just need to pass our two observed samples and specify that the two samples are unpaired by setting the unpaired argument to false. We use this function in part 1 to implement the signed rank test. If I pass in my data, I'll actually see that I fail to reject the null hypothesis. I would take this as statistical evidence that my software isn't appreciably reducing the amount of time on non-work sites. You can see that R states the alternative hypothesis in terms of the location shift. Depending on where you read about the test and what assumptions that source uses, it's possible to see these different statements about the alternative hypothesis. But here I've phrased it in more general terms using the CDF. Now that we've learned the MW2 test, you have the tools to perform some basic non-parametric statistics. But a question that comes up a lot is when and where should we use a non-parametric test, and conversely, when is it okay to use the t-tests instead? If the non-parametric tests allow us to make less assumptions, then why would we even bother to use the parametric tests in the first place? Like many things in statistics, the answer comes down to assumptions and trade-offs. So let's see what happens when we compare the two-sample t-test against the MW2 test in two different simulation studies. In one study, we'll generate data using the normal distribution, which means that the parametric assumption will be valid for this data set. In another set of simulations, we'll generate data from a standard Cauchy, which nope. doesn't meet the assumptions. After we generate the data set, we're going to conduct both the MW2 test and the t-tests on the same data set and compare their type 1 error and power. I'll be testing at a 95% significance level, and I'm going to use a location shift of 0.7 for my power simulations. Here's what happens. When the parametric assumption is true, 
we can see that both tests perform similarly in terms of type 1 error. Both of them are close to the theoretical 5% level. But look what happens when we use the Cauchy data. The type 1 error for the t-test is noticeably lower than the MW2 test. This isn't a good or bad thing, but it's just something to note. The most notable differences happen when we look at power. When the parametric assumption is true, the t-test is more powerful than the MW2 test. This difference might seem small, but it can play a significant role when planning an experiment. But the MW2 test is much more powerful when the assumption is violated. You can see a sharp drop in power in the t-test here. So if you're choosing between a parametric and non-parametric test, you really have to consider the specific data that you're planning to work with. If your research field is naturally prone to outliers, then it might be more efficient to choose the non-parametric test. But if you know that the data will stay in nice clumps, then the t-test will give you much more power. The t-test benefits from high power, but only when the assumptions needed to use it are reasonable. This is an illustration of the no-free-lunch theorem in statistics, which states that no one model can perform best in all situations. For many people not in statistics, it can already be overwhelming to deal with your own research. To have to consider the statistical details of your analysis might be too much for one person to handle. I'll be the first to say that there's no shame in consulting with a statistician and asking them for their advice. It's what us statisticians are here for. If you like this video and want to see more, then consider subscribing to the channel. I also keep up a weekly newsletter so you can know exactly when a new video comes up and get some extra content as well. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one.